Welcome to Module 1, What Can Science Tell Us About Creation and Design? This is the first module in a 12-module series entitled God and Modern Physics. It is presented by Father Robert J. Spitzer of the Magis Center of Reason and Faith, and it is based on his recently released book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy. Welcome to the Magis Center of Reason and Faith series, God and Modern Physics. What we're going to be doing is talking about the evidence for creation, design, in other words, the evidence for God that comes from physics and particularly contemporary astrophysics and cosmology. We're going to be looking at the origins of the universe and specifically do the, the constraints of the universe require a beginning. We're going to be looking at, well, what we'll call anthropic coincidences and whether those coincidences really do indicate supernatural design, not just simply design, but so much fine-tuning that it would really require almost the hand of a superintellect, as it were. And so uh, throughout this series, we're going to be talking a lot about, well, what is the universe, and what is it like, and when did it begin, and what are our theories about it? But before we begin all of that, we probably ought to talk about, well, what can science do, and what can't science do? Well, first of all, as you know, science can unearth a remarkable number of discoveries about the microscopic world and the macroscopic world, the, the world that can be seen through microscopes and the, the world that can be seen through telescopes. It, it certainly also can uh, come to theories about what the universe is like as a whole, and it can uh, have very well corroborated theories of what the universe is like, and, and even the laws of the universe, and even the amount of mass in the universe, and, and even the extent to which the observable universe has gone, and even its origins, and even if there is a necessity about a beginning. However, the one caveat with science is this, that when you talk about science, science is not like metaphysics, it's not like mathematics where you can deduce a proof in a strict sense, where if you deny the conclusion of the proof, you're going to come up with a contradiction that really is impossible to hold. Rather, science collects a whole stream of facts from empirical evidence, from measured evidence, from mathematical uh, study of these measured empirical facts, and inductively proceeds to building theories around this evidence. Now, you can have lots of evidence sets that all come together, and when they come together around the same set of numbers, you start calling that a well-corroborated theory because the odds of having all kinds of sets of evidence have the same set of numbers, the odds of that happening without the theory being correct is highly, highly improbable. So we start saying then, the more evidence that we get from different sources that all lead to the same set of numbers generated by the same theory, we call that theory a very well corroborated theory. But there's only one problem. Science really can't get to a complete explanation. It really doesn't know when it has discovered everything about the physical universe. So science always has to be open to other kinds of theories. It always has to be open to other kinds of discoveries that might come along. And so we see, of course, that the, the great theory of, of Sir Isaac Newton, why it was altered by Albert Einstein. And, and we saw, too, that, uh, that uh, all kinds of things that happened with the, the Big Bang Theory, while well, several different incremental pieces of evidence had to be integrated into it. It didn't completely uh, uh, undermine the theory, but it did adjust how the theory looked. So science has to be open to all kinds of other discoveries. So we don't say that science can come to an absolute truth, but what we can say about science is it can come to a very well corroborated theory. Which well corroborated theory has a high degree of probability of being true, and the high degree of probability has to be open to 
possible additional discoveries which could require modifications or changes in the theory, but until those evidence sets which would require a modification are really verified, are really seen to be true, you really ought to accept the highly corroborated theory as having a high degree of probability, a high degree of truth. And so that's where we stand with science, but that just gives you the thought that when we come to a conclusion then about creation or come to a conclusion about design, it, it's a highly probabilistic conclusion, and that highly probabilistic conclusion is grounded in all of these evidence sets leading to a similar set of numbers, to a similar theory, and that theory will give credence to until there's evidence to show otherwise. Well, let's just start off with what uh, has led to, uh, you know, the discovery of, uh, you know, a beginning and, and where did the evidence come from? When we started talking about supernatural design, where did this, all this evidence come from? Well, well it goes really back to 1923. Uh, to a Belgian priest, Father Georges Lemaitre, and we're going to be talking about him later, but he discovered what's called now the Big Bang Theory, and he and Albert Einstein uh, worked through this theory, and uh, you know, it essentially holds the following, and this is what we call today the Standard Big Bang Model. The Standard Big Bang Model holds that the universe be, well, at least the Big Bang occurred, and the Big Bang could be the beginning of the universe, but the Big Bang occurred about 13.7 billion years ago. And the universe itself, if you can imagine this, was like a little point, almost a dimensionless point, almost like a balloon that couldn't be deflated any further. I mean, the balloon got deflated literally to a, a very, very, very tiny point, just a, a little measure above a dimensionless point, and then, in a very hot, fiery explosion, the entire universe, and that means really space-time itself, began to expand very rapidly out of this fireball, this huge explosion. And it was like this balloon inflating. And if you can imagine for just a second that all the matter is on the surface of the balloon and the space field, the space-time field, is like the elastic on the balloon and that uh, all the matter in the universe is, is sort of like paint spots that are on the balloon, you can see that as space-time expands, as the balloon expands, as the, the elastic of the balloon expands, the entire universe begins then to, to get larger and larger, and all of the paint spots begin to move away from each other on this, uh, on this surface of the balloon or on the surface of space-time in the universe. And as everything moves away from everything else in this expansive universal condition, the universe gets larger and larger. Okay, what are some of the uh, dimensions of the universe that we know of today? Well, we say that the universe has approximately 4.6% uh, of what we'll call visible matter. And visible matter absorbs light and it emits light. It, that is to say, it absorbs and emits electromagnetic radiation. So it does electrical things. It does luminescent things. But that's only 4.6% of the matter in the universe. 23% of the matter in the universe is what we call dark matter. Dark matter really doesn't have an electromagnetic spectrum. And it doesn't do anything electrical or luminescent, but it does have gravitational effects. And as it has gravitational effects, therefore, it, it, it actually is, is attracting matter towards itself. And it, it does all the other things that, that, that you would expect matter to do with gravity without any electrical or luminescent effects. And then finally, the remaining 72.4% of the universe is what we call dark energy. And dark energy is not like anything else we know of. Dark energy has, of course, uh, it's like a field. And the field of dark energy is connected with the space-time field, like the elastic of this balloon. And, of course, it causes a tr tremendous repulsive force. And so, of course, the universe then is expanding and will continue to expand forever because of this abundance, 72.4% of the mass energy in the universe being dark energy. 
And we're going to discuss all of these constituents in far more detail in the upcoming modules. If you want more information, consult our website, modusreasonfaith.org. Thank you. To learn more about this series and the Magis Center of Reason and Faith, please visit www.magisreasonfaith.org. That is www.magisreasonfaith.org. You may purchase Father Spitzer's book on this subject, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy, on the website or through Amazon.com.